<laughs> Welcome back to r slash advertising school week seven guys. Uh, assignments last week were absolutely awesome. Um, you guys have submitted a ton of those over just like the last few days. So there are a lot of those that we have not gotten to yet. Um, some of the, some of the conversation in there, um, has been really great between students. I've noticed, uh, Joffrey and Adetunji and I think Olivia, um, and a few other students going in and commenting on each other's work. And I think that is something we should all like uh, do more of. That, that was like super helpful. And I think some of the insights from the other students have been, have been really great. So um, please do feel free to like go out and like comment on each other's assignments. That's going to be great and uh, get more people kind of get their work seen and get more perspectives out there. Um, this week's course is brand building with Sam Bergen. Sam Bergen um, is somebody that I briefly crossed paths with. I uh, had the fortune of working with him at Energy BBDO briefly. Uh, he has worked across Omnicom agencies. He is a creative director at Beats by Dre. Uh, he has some really interesting insights for us into what it takes to really build a great brand. And he has this experience of being both agency side and uh, within a big company. So if you guys have questions about in-house versus agency, Sam would be a really great person to uh, ask those questions to. And without further ado, uh, Sam would love to hear from you. Yeah, definitely. Um, really excited to see everyone through little tiny windows on my screen and to share this presentation with you guys. Um, I'm also a part-time teacher at Art Center down here in Los Angeles. And so hopefully it's like I'm cheating a little bit because I know how to run a class, but we'll see. We'll see. You guys can be the judge of that. Let me get this screen share thing working. Oh, Sam, one other thing that I forgot to mention. If you want oh, yeah. to ask questions or have people ask questions throughout, like feel free to do that and I'll unmute folks as they raise their hands. Um, and cool. otherwise guys, we will take kind of a Q&A session at the end. Yeah, we'll definitely do a Q&A at the end. Um, but if there's something in the middle of the presentation that cannot wait, uh, definitely chime in. Can you guys see the screen all right? We got it. So Joe called me and said he was putting this school together. Um, and as a person who grew up primarily as a digital creative, I was really excited about the concept of sort of this distributed learning model and sort of a, a school for the, the new era and having Reddit as like a backbone to it. So I was really excited about it. Um, I was asked to speak on brand building, which, you know, anyone who works in advertising or the marketing communication services industry it's a core part of what we do, but there isn't like a job where it's like, you know, I'm the person who builds the brand, right? So it's an interesting thing to actually try and present. So I wanted to go back first and look at a little history. Uh, let's see, there we go. Um, so historical evidence shows that people have been branding livestock since like 2000 BC, um, I think in the, uh, the Egyptian civilization they were. Branding livestock came to the US in the 1600s. This is uh, Hernan Cortez, one of the conquistadors. Um, he used three crosses, probably because they believed they were colonizing on behalf of their religion. Um, that led to a whole art form, actually, because as you know, ranching and cattle spread across the western side of the United States, brands were used to show ownership um, and eventually local local gov government started to protect those brands and so people had to register them and then it was a legal offense to alter or change them or to um, you know so if someone branded something and you came up and changed it or you copied it that became a legal issue that's what ultimately led to trademark copyright laws today um, so little history lesson there to get us primed up, but what is a brand is the first thing we should answer. And I would say that brand, um, you know, it's, I knew exactly what Joe wanted me to roughly talk about when he called and asked me about this. So, you know, brand is something that's commonly understood, meaning that most people know what it is. 
Uh, my mom knows what it is. You guys are going to work in advertising or marketing communications. Everyone you work with is going to know what a brand is. But I'd also say it's almost impossible to define. Um, but I'm just one person, so I consulted the internet. And if you kind of type in what is a brand and you search on images, you find slides like this, like this guy staring up at brand, which is pretty concrete and then a bunch of stuff around it. Um, you know, you've got a logo there, which I think people associate with brands. I'm guessing the microphones are advertising. Thumbs up is, you know, people liking your brands. There's like a org chart over here. I'm not sure if an org chart impacts your brand really. I don't know if like constant growth defines a brand. Um, this one feels kind of more human, which I like. Uh, marketing obviously plays a big role. You know, consumers being able to buy it does. Brand identity, um, having a vision and a mission statement. Seems like here, like, I don't know, either the price or, you know, the price tag or something is actually the biggest component. Um, Here's a little bit more of a systemized look at it, right? And I agree with a lot of these things. You need strategy, you know, it takes a village, planning, research, marketing. Uh, maybe this is for like a B2B audience because you have things like certification in here, or maybe it's for influencers. Um, SEO, I'm actually not sure what like search engine optimization would have to do with building a great brand besides the fact that it helps get it seen. Um, so, and then this is like a nice kind of simple overview. I like this one a lot. Um, trust is in here kind of for the first time, really called out cleanly and clearly, which I think is really important. Um, you know, every year they publish those like most hated brand lists and it's usually things where people have been violated by their trust. Um, you can define it as like a verb or an action, right? Branding. So they said, hey, it would be easier if we just focus on the action of creating a brand branding. Um, so yeah, you need an audience, you know, innovation probably in product and in marketing. I like this, they call out story, separate from marketing and advertising. So there's like a delineation between those couple of things. Um, this is a bit pixelated, so I apologize about that, but this is pretty comprehensive, right? It's the first one to actually call out trademarks, um, tagline, for you know, working in advertising. It even calls out a jingle, not that everyone brand, every brand needs a jingle to become you know, a great brand. Um, but this is pretty comprehensive. There's something on this I love that I'll come back to later. Uh, whoever made this decided, hey, let's just focus on brand identity, right? So of course, like logo, design, um, mission but then you have like culture does company culture affect the brand identity this communication looks like maybe customer service um does that really affect your brand probably yeah you know how you behave as a brand uh whoever created this decided that you could like you know make it as simple as something you'd learn in elementary or primary school with an acronym um blueprint relationship agreement nature distinctive I don't know if I agree with much of this, besides distinctive, I think is really important, actually. Um, if you think about probably your favorite brands or brands that you love or something you wanna to build towards, right? Joe was talking before about, it's not the right guy to work on cars and he likes them, right? But he doesn't love them in the same way that a car person loves them, right? But if you love cars, um, every brand is incredibly distinct. I kind of think whoever created this might have been the smartest of the bunch, right? Because they didn't actually put any words on paper. They just said, here's a bunch of really cool icons and I'm gonna let you project whatever you want on this. So, hey, I have a magical product, right? That's pretty great. Uh, we tell people about it. You know, it's impossible to ignore. It's like a bomb, it's like a rocket ship working here. We're top of the mountain. This thing makes all the money it's supposed to make. Um, you know, I kind of like this one quite a bit. So I hope that illustrates the point of how difficult it is to define what a brand is. Um, but we can go also to like the most populous place possible, right? Wikipedia. So a brand is a name, term, design, symbol, or any other feature that identifies one seller's good or service distinct, right? Distinctive, there's a line again, from those of other sellers. 
Um, there's a lot that's right in this, actually. I think this is pretty strong in that regard. So you think of a name, um, Gillette, right? If you say this, people think of razors, even though it's actually a person's name. Um, there's a place called Gillette Castle in, uh, in Connecticut named after the Gillette family. There's a career abductor named Jeff Gillette out there. Uh, you could put Toyota there, Ford there. We were talking about the Bronco before. Um, so then term, Kleenex, right? Kleenex is a made up word, but it's actually uh, one brand and it's, it, became, it became universal for like face tissues, right? You could put Google here. After COVID, you could put Zoom here, probably, right? or on Zoom, Zooming. Um, design. So there's obviously like product design, but then there's designs, right? Like the iPod here. And so while this isn't the actual industrial design of the iPod, this icon of it stands for it. Someone could draw the VW Beetle or the Coca-Cola bottle and you would know what that is as well, right? That's part of their brand uh, or a symbol. So I think of logo when I hear that. Um, Nike, you could put Apple here, you could put a golden M with you know, arched tops and you know it's McDonald's. So there's a lot that's right about this. And then there's this element that's a little bit, you know, wishy-washy of any other feature that, that identifies one seller's goods or service that's distinct from other sellers. So that's a bit wishy-washy, but we'll come back to that in a second. Um, so I think while this is like helpful, I don't know if it actually gets us any closer to really being able to understand what it takes to build a brand. Um, yeah, you need a name, it should be distinct, you need a logo and probably some designs that you need to be able to distinguish yourself. Um, but I find it's probably helpful also to think about it from the customer standpoint, right? So I mentioned before, my mom knows what a brand is and then everybody I work with knows what a brand is. My mom probably thinks of a brand a little bit differently. Um, she probably thinks about it in a way of what she thinks or feels when she hears or sees a brand name or a logo. Um, so it's really experiential, right? And I think that's really important um, because a brand is something that's, you know, unique to whoever is operating, whoever is consuming it, right? Whether that's the actual product or a piece of media about it. Um, so this actually takes me to, my like personal point of view on it, which is in its purest form, I believe a brand is an idea. Um, so it's not any of the, whatever last 20 slides I showed you guys, but it's actually, you know, an idea. And an idea is something you wanna build a relationship with your audience and then you want them to feel a certain kind of way about your idea. And that's how you start to build towards a brand. So, but again, this is not a class about what is a brand, it's actually about brand building. So we'll then pivot to talk about building a brand. Um, so my personal philosophy on brand building and ideas in general is to approach it like an entrepreneur. And the reason I, this is something I actually developed a number of years ago and it's sort of a, a lighthouse or a North Star for my career. Um, and I'll walk you guys through it. At the core of this, if you really want to build something, I believe you have to take responsibility for it. Um, so, you know, if you look at an entrepreneur, you know, Joe and Dan are in San Francisco. I think they're everywhere there. There's a lot here in LA too, a lot in New York, any of the big cities now in the US or around the world. Um, but it's a person who organizes, operates, and assumes the risk for a business venture. Now you may be thinking, you know, Sam, I don't have what it takes to be an entrepreneur. Like I'm, I'm not an entrepreneur. I, I can, can agree with you and understand what that feels like. And the reality is that only 12% of the workforce here in the U S are entrepreneurs, which means the other 88% of us are employees. But the reality is that hundred percent of us can be creative entrepreneurs, at least the way I define it. And I define it as a person who organizes, operates, and assumes the risk for the creation of an idea. And go back a few slides. Remember I said, you know, for me, in its purest form, I believe a brand is an idea. And so I'm encouraging all of you who will go out into the world or you've just started or wherever you are at in your journey and path, um, 
to build brands through creative problem solving um, the way that a creative entrepreneur would. And I, I'm, I happen to be, you know, a creative by trade and I've, you know, started to take on other marketing responsibilities as my career has gone forward. Um, so I don't say this as purely a, you know, creative director, right? Whether you're in um, strategy or production or account management or user experience or data analytics or the media side of stuff, I believe the principles that, you know, drive creative entrepreneurship are stuff that all of us can apply. Um, you know, creativity and being able to solve problems for brands that will then build their brands is something that everyone has to do in these roles. And so, you know, yes, it's easy to think of an idea as an ad that we were talking about, right? Beginning of class of the latest Stella ad or whatever it might be. But, you know, a great media strategy is also an idea. Um, trying something new is also an idea. And so, keep that in your mind as I talk through this, but also as you just go throughout your career. Um, there's a saying, everyone's creative, and there's, you know, there's dual, there's arguments on both sides of that. And then the, this isn't a, this isn't a statement one way or the other about everyone being creative, but it's a statement about, you know, I think we all have a responsibility to bring creative problem solving to the brands that we work on. Um, so I'll walk through what I think are probably the seven most important things to remember when you're building brands. So these are going to be sort of like tenants or foundational elements to what a brand is. Um, things to keep in mind as you go to work on them, as you work on projects. Again, there's never going to be like a person who is 100% the brand. That just doesn't happen. Um, you're going to be, you know, contributing to it. So the first thing is, you know, a brand is fluid. So you think of Dropbox, um, if anyone looked at the case study at our latest, you know, brand identity, it's actually really beautiful. It kind of says it can be lots of things to anybody, actually, which is what I think is really beautiful and great about it. Um, it's got a lot of press. There was some negativity about it, but in general, I think it's actually really smart. Um, they offer one core service, right, which is cloud storage. Um, but for some people, you know, it's a digital safety blanket that's on every screen they own. And that's their experience of Dropbox, right? Um, for another person, it's how they back up their photos, um, which are, you know, if you've ever lost a phone, you're probably most upset about losing your photos. And so a person who comes in, like, you know, my mom uses Dropbox only for photos, doesn't understand that I can send, you know, I can send her other things or anything about it. Um, and so you think about the fluidity of something as simple as we offer one thing, but the way you come in can be very different. And the brand stands for something a little bit different to each person who uses it. A uh, brand is the sum of its parts. Um, you look at Nike, one of the biggest brands in the world. Uh, you consider all the categories they have, and you know, I'm guessing probably everyone on this call has some piece of Nike apparel or something. Um, and they're a case study for branding, of course. Uh, but I'll break it down in like really two, I think, simple looks. Is if you're into sneakers at all, like this might be the brand to you, right? Um, I know people who are on here every single day. Um, so they spend more time probably engaging with the sneakers app than they do anything else. And that's, uh, you know, there's a whole gamified, almost like you know, people call it an addiction, whether you're trying to get or not get a pair of sneakers. Um, and I love that, that for so many people, like this has become the brand. Um, if you're into fitness, it could be the Nike training app or Nike running app. They've done a really good job of, you know, there's so many different pieces. And then there's their, you know, really amazing and compelling advertising, which is, this is the Colin Kaepernick ad. Um, and it's how Nike in a lot of ways got famous. So you look at these two things and I think a lot of people would say, yeah, this ad is how they build their brand. But I probably guarantee you there's a bunch of young people out there growing up more on Nike 
on the sneakers app than on their classic advertising that you know runs on big television and in the you know, New York Times out of home. Brands are delicate. Um, so for each of those sums of parts I talked about, right? Nike's got the store experience as well. Um, each one of those things is also very delicate and you have to treat it that way. Um, you know, if you remember, there was somebody yanked off a United Airlines flight a couple years ago and United Airlines quickly jumped to a bunch of like top 10 most hated brands. Um, you look at the, you know, infamous Pepsi ad um, that trivialized Black Lives Matter and that movement. Um, while the perception of the brand recovered in a year this article talks about, um, they actually reached an eight year low of purchase consideration because of that ad. And this was written a little bit after, a little over a year after the ad ran and purchase consideration had not gotten back up. So, you know, you look at probably the decision of one person to pull somebody off United Airlines flight and the domino effect of that. You look at the decision of, you know, ultimately, you know, a bunch of people making that Pepsi ad um, and they have essentially irreparable damage. So you have to consider how, you know, delicate these things that we work on are, right? You'll be one of many people again working on a brand. And I go back to the idea of creative entrepreneurship. If you're not taking responsibility for it and actually caring for it, you know, the brand probably shouldn't be in your hands because you don't, you know, you're not actually taking responsibility for its success. Um, the other thing that I think is important to mention is a brand has to be commercially viable. Um, I put Uber in here for sort of for fun. Um, you know, I think when they, you know, they're taking a beating because of COVID, but you know, they were rated at $82 billion, which is like unheard of for an IPO. Um, you know, when people are thinking about a brand, they actually think about the value of the brand. They don't look at the dollars and cents that it makes, right? Nobody ranks brands on, you know, who's, you know, making the most money. There's obviously the fortune, you know, 500 and things like that, but those are like business scales. No one's on there asking like squishy, emotional, how do you think or feel about this brand? You know, so it's important to remember that <clears throat> I think a lot of times brands, again, going back to them being ideas, they sell a vision, right? They sell a future. And Uber does, you know, I think an amazing job of selling a future. They sell, they sell a vision. So I think historically Uber's never made any money, right? So that's like the comical thing about this is they weren't making money and they were still somehow worth $82 billion because people believed in the brand. They believed in the idea that in the future, nobody would have cars, right? It'll probably be robots driving us around, but they're probably gonna be Ubers. You know, in the future, you know, UPS might go away because Uber Freight is gonna take it over. In the future, you know, all my food gets delivered by Ubers, right? So they, they were able to sell this amazing idea, this amazing brand, and people really bought into it. Um, Brands need to be built for both the short term and the long term. I think this is a really important thing because I think, you know, business in general gets caught up in, you know, quarterly stock updates and how are we performing this quarter. And there's always a push and pull and there's, you know, retail marketing, which is designed to drive short term, you know, customer conversion. There's brand marketing designed to drive, you know, long term loyalty and love and you know people who will buy your products again and again and again and i do think you actually need both of them right because if you can't drive success or turnarounds in short terms and there is no long term but if you don't actually consider what your brand means and the role it plays in the world going forward you're not actually building a brand you're not really taking responsibility for it um these two Burger King ads, I think, are really great. One is, you know, the short term, like, we want to be the number one downloaded app. We want to get to a million downloads. We want people to use our app. So they come up with a great ad for that. Um, you know, the second is, 
you guys saw the the moldy whopper right this is all about looking at a future where we have more sustainable ingredients um healthier food in fast food situations and i think these two things do a great job of showing how yes there's like short-term things that we can do but there's long-term things that we need to be doing as well um i think a lot of the you know the greatest ads are things that build for the long term of the brand. So then I go back to the slide, which I mentioned I was gonna come back to. A brand is everyone's responsibility. Um, you'll hear stories of, you know, I think Intel had over a hundred agencies at one point in time, and these consolidations that brands do because they've got all these different agencies, right? Each of these things on this list could actually be a different agency. Um, and I like this because it's the only one that calls out a concept, right? It's the only one that really like actually pays attention to the fact that a brand is an idea. But if you think about a couple of the slides that I've talked about before, you know, when you're one of, you know, three, five, 20 agencies working on a launch or a project or something, if you don't do your part, and you don't take responsibility for making you know the idea that you're working on the best thing it can be to build that brand you know you're in that situation where this brand is delicate and if you don't take care of it you could actually damage it and then lastly building a brand is an art and not a science um there's a great I almost wanted to play it for you guys, but I was sensitive of time. There's this great interview with Kanye West um, and Sway, I think on Hot 97. Um, if you just Google Kanye and you know, not Ralph, uh, not Ralph level, the video will come up for anyone who hasn't seen it yet. And um, it basically like, it's Kanye forecasting his future um, and the passion he has around it and there's no science in it, right? And Elon Musk is obviously a brilliant individual um, and uses science to achieve everything he does. But the brand that he built, you know, they're both case studies in how amazing marketing can drive these brands. And yes, they are one person. And I said before, brands aren't one person, but they are backed by these massive machines um, with lots of people. and. There's a great article, I think, from last week about, you know, Kanye's new website. And the article is actually with his creative partner who we made the website with. Um, so, again, even in these situations with these, you can almost say, really, Kanye is synonymous with Yeezy and Elon is synonymous with Tesla. But even with them, it's not them alone that's doing this, right? Kanye did it with nike first and then adidas and now he's going on to gap and in the middle of that there's a bunch of contributors um this isn't a point but the next thing i'm going to talk about i think is important to remember is that it's also like very important business um this is a gartner research survey that just came out that said brand, brand strategy is the most vital marketing capability in 2020 um, and it jumped up from what like number eight or nine and so it's important to keep in mind that what we're doing is there is a very commercial aspect to it, right? I mentioned commercially viable before. Part of the responsibility, I think, of bringing ideas forward is weighing those risks in your head. And you know, are they actually gonna be part of making this brand successful? Um, but just know that whatever clients, so there's, you know, chief marketing officers, chief brand officers, just a marketing director, whoever you're working with or working for, like they really care about this stuff, right? Especially right now. I think that, you know, in times of crises, people look to protect their most important assets. And there is a bunch of academic research out there that actually talks about how for a lot of brands, a lot of companies, you know, one of their core competencies and one of their most valuable assets are their actual brands. Um, so go look that up if you have any questions about it. And this now takes us to our assignment.
which was inspired by the Dalai Lama. Um, so in search of clarity and direction, one's enemy is actually the best teacher, which leads us to the fact that I would like you guys to choose a brand that you hate and rebuild it so that you would love it. Um, first off, run this assignment through your own filter. So again, I mentioned, you know, no matter what background or whatever you studied or whatever job you're trying to get, the tenants that I discussed here are important to you. So run this assignment through that filter, right? This isn't about um, taking the Federal Express logo and making it FedEx. If you're a designer, it could be that. Um, but it could be something much more um, based in a media strategy or a brand strategy or, you know, a mission statement or something that, again, is not a purely creative task in the traditional sense of the creative department. Um, think about what the goal of this assignment is for you. You know, is it a portfolio piece? Is it to sharpen your skills? Is it because you're trying to constantly improve? Um, really know why you're making it. You know, I put in hate and love because these are really strong emotions. So I want you to be, you know, attached to this assignment on an emotional level. And part of the reason I did that is because, you know, Hopefully one day you'll be, you know, in a job interview situation and maybe this assignment will come up, right? Maybe you make something that you're actually really proud of and it goes in your portfolio or it becomes something that you touch on time and time again in your career. And when you sit there and talk to a person who, you know, you're discussing a job with, if you can build an emotional connection with them, then you're going to be one step ahead of anybody else who they're also talking to. And these ideas of hate and love um, attached to these brands that people hate and love and our emotional connection to them, I think is, can be a really compelling place for you guys to look for a job from. Um, if I was you, I would start by figuring out, you know, making a list of what brands I don't like. You know, if you have a single brand that you hate, great. If not, list out a bunch and then figure out what's wrong with that brand. Like, what do you hate the most? Get, get focused, get specific, right? You know, if you hate Nike, don't just say you hate Nike, dive in and talk about what you hate about Nike, whether it's one of the apps, one of the product lines, you know, one of the ads they've made. Um, and then by rebuilding it, you're actually taking responsibility for creating something that people will love. So this puts us exactly, I think, at 30 minutes. And uh, that's the end. Oh, man, that, that was awesome. And I, uh, I love the assignment. Um, Sam, can I get you to, there you go. I'm sure. Yeah, for that work. Um, yeah, I, I think this is a, a super interesting challenge for folks. Uh, I, it was interesting for me. Not everybody can do Comcast. I want to put that out there. <laughs> <laughs> that's um, one of goodby's that's one of goodby's clients so you gotta be careful over here i'm just i actually they have an amazing presence on reddit i i wrote about it like they they have a best in class subreddit that has totally changed the perception of them on the platform in my mind right. um guys if you have questions please uh please do the little hand raisey thing um or if you must type it into the chat can do that. Atunji, I'm gonna unmute you. Thank you. Um, that was a really great session, Sam. Um, I learned quite a lot from it. Um, so I just a bit of backstory. I did check out um, a lot of the experience that you had, and I suppose because it's directly related to what you've taught us today, I wanted to ask, what is the difference? between your creative director role at Deutsch and your VP role, which is also a creative position at Beats by Dre in, in the term, terms of you know, brand building and how the work is different, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, <clears throat> you know, it was interesting. In my time at Deutsch, I went from first working on PlayStation 
where we are the agency of record for them. So we, by default, did all of the you know, hardware and software ads for them. And so we were you know, very in touch with them. Um, it was actually just like a huge honor as a creative. I was invited to, when they were gearing up to launch PlayStation 4, they did a whole you know deep rebrand session with a consultancy called eat big fish which is worth looking up if you guys haven't heard of them um you know and i was like one of two people from the agency invited to that process and so in that instance i was you know very deeply involved at the same time i was still not part of the company right i was an external point of view by the time i left deutsch when I was working on Target and Nintendo and a couple other brands, all those relationships were actually project-based. And so in the short time that I was there, it wasn't that short, but in the few, you know, three, four years I was there, I actually got to witness, I think, one of the shifts that we've seen in the industry quite a bit, which is going from, you know, these uh, really locked in agency of record relationships, which are still everywhere and are very, very prevalent. Um, there are just fewer of them to these project-based relationships where you're not really invited to comment so deeply on the brand, right? You're hired to do a task, do a project. So I would say that being in-house at a company, it's more similar to what I was doing first at Deutsch, where you know, if we're having deep brand conversations, I have a you know loud voice in that situation. The difference on being, you know, in-house versus at an agency so if i compare that deutsch experience on playstation to where i'm at right now is you know you are internal and so you you understand things on a different level and that can be a you know a blessing and a curse right you look at the pepsi ad and that's a classic you know reason why sometimes an external point of view is really helpful or, or not always having um not always having uh not always you know, making sure that you're always like considering how you're going to show up to the rest of the world. But that's part of my job as the creative there. Um, I will that's... say that both environments are amazing and both environments are incredibly fulfilling. Um, and I also say like when it comes to agencies, there's a lot of similar agencies, right? Cause a lot of them are owned by one of four holding companies. And those holding companies have, you know, they've been doing this for decades, so they know how to set up this business. Um, so you go from one agency to the next, and it's probably going to be a pretty similar experience. Your client's going to be different. Your team's going to be doing a lot will be different. But in a sense, it'll feel like I know, I know what I'm doing. My sense, and I've only worked in-house really, you know, once. Um, my sense is that it's pretty, it can be pretty different in-house, depending on where you're at and how it's structured and how it's set up. Thanks, Sam. Um, if you don't, guys don't mind, I'd just like to ask a follow-up question to that. Um, so it is different, like you said, and what type of work do you do now at Beats? Um, all the marketing communication work. So anything you see out in the world, basically besides product or packaging. Ah, right, thank you. Yep. Just that. <laughs> um, I want to, I want to, we have, we have, uh, another person with a hand up. I want to, I want to ask a quick question I, and it's, it's something that's related to uh, topics that have come up in, in previous sessions that I think has been really interesting. And Sam, I feel like you have like a really unique perspective on, um, throughout your, your presentation, you kind of balanced academic examples that we would look at as like the ads that captured attention in ad week. And you also showed examples of these are hardworking ads or hardworking brand pieces that are out in the world and kind of carrying that for people, you know, for everyday users. How, how do you kind of think about balancing those, those two? In some senses, it's a little bit of long-term and short-term again, right? <clears throat> those everyday engagements like, you know, sneakers that took investment, that took risk, that took, uh, you know, vision in a lot of ways um, to build something that wasn't just an ad, 
right? Obviously an ad gone wrong can be detrimental to your business. So probably the stakes in some ways are like higher with an ad. Like if you make a bad app, you know, unless you're doing something, you know, horrible in that app, um, you can just pull the app down, right? And people probably forget about it, but you make this ad and you put a lot of money behind, it's like such a visible thing. Um, but I think, you know, there's this, again, back to the academic stuff, you know, brands that don't innovate eventually die. And, you know, while advertising I think is very innovative and you can leverage it as a, as a tool to build this big emotional connection. If the actions the brand makes or the products it makes or the other things it makes for consumers as touch points don't reinforce that, you know, people, especially nowadays, will just think you're hollow and they'll probably, it's like, yeah, you make great ads, but I'm not going to engage in your stuff. So it's, you know, ideally, everything I said is true, which is, you know, you have an idea and you're building towards an idea and there's ads that build towards that idea and there's experiences and everyday things that build towards that idea that, you know, on a brief, maybe don't sound as compelling as an amazing ad with this amazing star telling this amazingly relevant message right now. But actually, probably when the reality hits, you know, that app or that whatever is going to be is actually going to be way more compelling in the long run. Yeah, I think that that frame anchors the two in a really nice way. Um, Brandon, I'm gonna I'm gonna unmute you here. Test, test, can you hear me? You're a little quiet, but uh, but give it a try. I guess I'll just project my voice and hopefully you guys can hear me. Uh, well, uh, back, back to your prior point about brands being fragile and also the assignment you gave us. Can you give us one of your favorite examples of a brand that you personally hated a lot, but then over time you uh, move towards a more neutral or positive uh, view of them? Yeah, let me try and think of like the simplest example for you guys. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think this is also a pretty classic one, like Target is one of them. Um, you know, their move to, you know, bring designers in and democratize design, I think was brilliant. Um, and to also just like, focus on the bullseye as their, their main communication device um, and to really invest in the flow of their stores. And so to me, that was a great example of a, you know, a store that I grew up with that I had fond memories of that I fell out of love with that I fell back in love with. I see. Thank you. And um, I just have one more quick question. Uh, I personally only have one agency experience and understanding that you currently have, uh, I mean, you currently work in-house with Beats by Dre. Can you tell me what would surprise uh, advertising people in agency side about your day-to-day -day at Beats by Dre? It's a really good question. Again, it, you know, the, what I said before about every in-house experience, I think is, is pretty different is something I'll point to first is that, you know, my experience of something that's unique um, at beats may not be the same as someone else. Um, let's see. So I think we're in an era now where a lot of marketing departments feed into the website. They don't manage the website. Um, you know, you saw like a rise of chief, chief digital officers or e-com people or, you know, sales, right. And a lot of companies, their website is actually a user experience flow or it's, it's not managed by marketing anymore. Um, maybe 20 years ago it was cause it was, you know, a storefront in that sense. But, um, at Beats, we manage um, the website and the marketing team. 
And that's something I didn't expect coming into the business. That's super interesting. Yeah, and I'm sure that people recognize that going to an in-house place is totally going to be, that those cultures will be totally determined by those companies where I think to your point, agency life tends to be agency life. Um, I'm going to ask you a quick question. Um, one of the things that we talked about in this course was uh, port portfolio building and how whether you're an account manager or a producer or a strategist, it's great to kind of represent your own personal brand, right? You know, yep. when thinking about brands. Um, so I, I kind of have two questions and this is kind of like on behalf of the students and uh, the online folks that are, that are tuning in. Um, the first is what kind of catches your eye? Um, whether it be a producer or a strategist or, or a creative, maybe it, it's different for each, for each one. Um, and what can they do to kind of attract your attention? Uh, and the second part of that question is, you know, these are quote unquote unprecedented times. Um, what would your advice to uh, folks entering the market um, at this time be? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> in terms of stuff that catches my eye, I think it's usually people who go above and beyond. You know, if I see a portfolio where it's just the work, you know, if especially someone I think coming into the business, um, if it's just the work, it's just like, yeah, I put, you know, I don't even know what they tell you now, but you know, they used to say put, you know, six campaigns of three print ads was my entree. Um, if it's just the bare minimum, that's not going to be very exciting. I care a lot more about what other experience you had in life, right? That could be career stuff, that could be education stuff, that could be family stuff, that could be travel stuff, it could be interests. Um, but I think, you know, what we don't need is a bunch of advertising robots running around who all they wanna do is, I make ads and that's my life, right? You need people who have diverse perspectives and you need people who care about other things and you need people, you need people who are willing to work long hours, but want work-life balance because they have something else worth balancing it for. And when they're young, that's usually not a family. Sometimes it is, right? Um, but if they don't have some, they don't. If they don't have something worth balancing work for, then they're just bringing one dimension to the to the office every day. Um, so for me, it's it's that. You know, it's like what else do they have besides the work? Um, and then unprecedented times. Yeah, uh, you know, I read the news multiple times a day and uh, I just, you know, sometimes can't believe it. And so I really, really feel for anyone who's out there looking for a job right now. It's just a tough, tough time. Um, I don't know if I have any smart expert advice on, on what to do besides, you know, don't forget that we're all humans. I don't know if anyone watched the latest season of Westworld. Um, but there's this scene where Aaron Paul gets declined from a job and he realizes it's a robot who's declining him. Um, and I thought about how awful that would probably be as someone who like has many times put themselves out there. And like I said, is like, I'm looking for people who, you know, aren't just robots. Right. Uh, interestingly enough, but, um, and so I think, I think that, you know, it's like, remember in these situations that you're a person. So, you know, make sure and keep respect for yourself. Um, and whoever you're talking to is also a person. And, you know, I think a lot of jobs, and you guys probably all know this and probably have talked about it, don't come from job postings. They come from, you know, the fact that you spoke to someone who spoke to someone who, you know, or whatever it is. So I think the, the humanity side of it is the thing that I would lean into. And I've also found you know, now more than ever that people want to be human. Um, when I teach at Art Center, I always tell people to, you know, what's the job you want in five years? Get super specific about that job. And then go find five people who have that job and just reach out to them. You know, they'll probably be pretty young in their career still. They're not going to be 20 year veterans because you won't get there in five years. Most likely you might. If so, hats off to you. But the average person, you know, in five years is still looking at a junior mid-level mid role. That person's probably, you know, pretty open to having a conversation with someone. Yeah, I think that's, that's fantastic cool. advice. Thank you. That's great advice for everybody. 
And I think consistent with some of the other veterans that we've, we've heard that just, you know, finding a way to like make personal connections, you know, or just to like find someone that you have a connection with, not to like use your connection, but to genuinely have a relationship with somebody is, it's how I got every single one of my jobs. And I think it's, it's really important. Um, Alexa, I'm going to unmute you. Hi, thank you so much for the presentation. And I wrote down so many notes about that last thing. Super helpful during the job hunt right now. My question is pretty simple. It was just about um, like when we're presenting a brand, like in a pitch or something. So if a campaign has an idea statement that drives like the 360 campaign, what does a rebrand have? Um, again, I know that you're not a full agency. Right. So if you're talking about the assignment, then it's why I sort of advise to like pick a brand, then think about what you hate about it and, you know, rebuild that part of the brand. Um, a rebrand, when I've seen them, usually starts with, you know, rewriting a new vision or a new mission statement for the company, which is the new idea the company is going to stand for. Um, and that's a helpful framework for anybody because everybody here can write a couple sentences. Um, you know, I think Nike again, as the perennial case study is, you know, if you have a, if you have a body, you're an athlete or something like that, if they have a website for it. If you Google Nike in those words, that'll come up. Um, so it can be as like high level as that, or it can be, you know, significantly much more focused. Um, so I would think through it. If you want to go to the highest level possible when you're talking about like a big agency pitch, a rebrand is going to start there. It's like we're rebranding the idea of the company. So it also has like an idea statement. It's just in a different context. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. And as you guys are thinking about guys, format for this assignment, oh, sorry, who did I interrupt? It was me. You go and I'll, and I'll jump in. I was just going to say, I, like format wise, like try to just think of things that will one work well in your portfolio and that two are, are easy for you to share among this group and then more broadly, if you'd like. So the formats that have worked well so far are pages on your portfolio site that works really well. Um, the Google slide presentations and really any slide presentation you can make available like to a wide audience work really well. I think if you just want to write or you just want to do some kind of art direction or some kind of visual styling for this, that works really well too. I think ahead, maybe some, some, one thing that might be helpful to look at too is, is how brands have done this in the past. Um, thinking about um, the different campaigns um, whereby uh, like I, what comes to mind is the, the pizza turnaround. I think it was Domino's, right? Was it, no, it was, um, was it Pizza Hut or Domino's? Domino's. Definitely. Well, Domino's, yeah. Most famous, they said their product was bad and they were going to redo it. <laughs> and they had their president, I think, in the ad, like burning the recipe in the yeah. pizza oven or something like that. Yeah. And knocking down their own stores. That's just a good yeah. example. So like, look at that kind of stuff because that might guide your uh, campaigns. Kevin, I'm going to unmute you for your question. Hey, can you hear me, Sam? Yep. Cool. Hey, uh, quick question. I checking out your LinkedIn page, and you have a heavy emphasis on um, acquisition and retention. And I was just curious if if that was the perspective of acquisition and retention from a customer perspective, like McDonald's, or from a customer perspective for the client. And if it was the former, how do you go about determining? Do you wait for a customer to come, or is there some sort of way that you can leg up yourself into that sort of conversation? Um, I mean, it plays, I would say, on both fronts. Like, I care a lot about CRM. Um, <clears throat> I don't think you'll see a bunch of creatives talk about that. But, um, you know, I, I have this sort of thought in the back of my head that in a lot of ways, Instagram 
is what delivers on the promise of the internet. Um, it's a, you know, it's a beautiful experience. Even the ads are gorgeous because if they don't, they don't perform, right? Um, it's, you know, you can connect with people you're very close with. You can deep dive into things when you're in it. It feels very open. If you go to explore, it feels like it knows you and it's learning you. Like I kind of love a lot of that stuff. Um, and I think about the marketing side of it, which if you speak to anyone who works on, you know, performance-based marketing, especially on social media, they know that, you know, if I hit the average target audience person 37 times with a message and they don't convert, I should stop hitting them with a message because I'm not going to convert them. But for a lot of people, it takes 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, you know, pops up in their feed for them to actually convert. And when it works and the product is good, everybody wins, right? Like I recently got bought something in that capacity and I got it. And I'm like, this thing is amazing, right? And along the way, I was slowly building an obsession with it in my head every time they served me an ad. And I'm pretty confident on the back end, they know that, right? And of course they got my email address. So there's them acquiring me. Now with email address, now is their opportunity to retain me, right? So again, probably something you don't hear a lot of creatives talk about is like, what's my email strategy? And how is that reinforcing? Again, that's probably like one of the everyday things that Joe was talking about, right? Long-term and an amazing email strategy for a brand, you can probably connect that to more sales and ROI than you can a big brand campaign. Um, yet the value of both is, is really important. Um, it's in my work and in my profile because if I go back to my tenant of being a creative entrepreneur and really taking responsibility for the work that I make, I can't just make amazing work and then not care about how we get, cons get consumers and then do we actually retain them or not. And so that's why it's something I've touched on and why I've invested a fair amount of time getting pretty educated on, on the topic. But if there's anyone here um, who is a data scientist, I am by no means you. I am a humble copywriter who, you know, has worked his way up the ranks and just like to fancy in the broader skills of marketing. Does that answer your question? That's a nod. Cool. All right. We've got two more questions and then I think we'll, uh, we should probably wrap up here. Um, but Aiden, why don't we, uh, unmute you? You ready to answer, ask your question? Yeah. Um, I don't know how to ask this, but it's something I've been thinking about a lot. And um, with like the presidential election coming up, I feel like Trump has a very strong brand and like the Democratic Party kind of chose to go with almost a non-brand or like someone that was very malleable. And I feel like this is a recent trend where like Kirkland Signature, if you don't want to get political, is like a company that doesn't really have a strong brand per se, but they buy smaller companies that has uh, stronger brand messaging and stuff like that. So I'm wondering how does this sort of like non-branding uh, trend or like method really work in this field where uh, like a strong brand message and branding is like increasingly more important to like survive? Yeah, I mean, on, on, on the first part, I'll just point back to something I said earlier, which is you can have the best, you know, marketing to build a really impressive brand, but if the experience for consumers isn't there, then it eventually kind of, you know, falls apart. Um, <clears throat> and like, and I, th I do think there's a world, right, of brand doesn't matter, right? There's a world of commodities where people probably just want the most affordable thing possible. Um, those commodities don't build a massive industry like the one that we work in, right? Um, or they don't make the great work that we aspire to make. So. I think you find you know fewer people attached to them, and it's less of a less of an ecosystem. Um, you know, there was that company Brandless, right? That um, didn't succeed. There's a good sort of case study on them if you want to look into that. And you know, there's 
a number of companies who you know compete purely on on price and availability and ease of use um but they're not companies that you know people when they think about them there's not a lot of thoughts or feelings right when they hear or see their brand name there isn't a lot of thoughts and feelings doesn't mean they don't make a good product that does exactly what it says it does and it's you know the right price point and can still have a great product and a terrible brand okay so at that point usually it's quality that is the defining factor well it, again you know love is in the eyes of the beholder right so it probably matters what you want if you want, <clears throat> if you're in the commodity space of the brand, of the place like where they don't prioritize brand, it's either quality or it's cost usually. And then so you will care, which do you care about, quality or cost? So you end up being the one actually that decides that. And they probably play on both strategies. And then performance marketing, they probably dial their messages according to you and they have you figured out. Um, when you're a bigger brand, I think what they're playing on is actually like how you think and feel about them, they're not playing so much on quality. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Uh, I have one like side question too. Um, you mentioned that you're a teacher at Art Center. Would you mind later um, sharing the books you recommend for your students to read? Just you know, I teach, I teach a, a class in the final term where it's designed to help them, you know, really just get more work or finish work in their books to get out. And so I don't teach like a core curriculum where I'm doing any foundational work with them. It's kids who are about to graduate and about to go look for work. Um, so I actually don't recommend books on a standard basis. Um, I can try and come up with a couple of things and share it with Joe to have him uh, make sure they get distributed though. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. We'll include that in the, uh, in the subreddit post before Sam's hand on giving us some book recos. Hold me to it. <laughs> uh, last question here is from Joffrey. Go ahead and unmute you. Cool. Hey Sam. Thanks so much. Um, my question is about career career building. I like how you framed this as being responsible for a brand. And I'm just wondering if for if you've had this experience or if this would be your advice that to build a career as a brand builder, it's important to find a brand that you whose purpose you believe in. And do you think that people will make the best work and have the and be more responsible? when they find opportunities to work with brands that they believe in versus just taking an opportunity to build your portfolio with a big brand, but maybe it's something that you don't, you know, you don't vibe with. Yeah. Well, I'm curious how the assignment goes over for you, or I'm asking you to work on a brand that you hate on. Um, but, uh, but the twist is I'm asking you to turn it into something you love, right? So I'm giving you the opportunity to take something that you might hate, and make it something that you love. So I'm curious how that experience will feel to you. Um, I mean, I think, you know, again, going back to the conversation at the very beginning of class, Joe was like, you know, I'm not the guy to work on cars because he doesn't love cars. And that's not even a brand purpose thing. That's just a pure interest thing, right? So I think there's a couple things to it is, you know, I mentioned this before is like, you're a human, right? You have values, you know, don't compromise those values for your job. Um, you know, I'm guessing everyone here can find work that aligns with those values. So, you know, and it's not uncommon practice. I've been in agencies, um, you know, where we've had fast food and people said, you know, I don't want to work on fast food. And so, you know, it, it doesn't have to be something like terrible, like cigarettes to, you know, say, Hey, I just don't, I don't feel comfortable working on that if you're in a pool of creatives. Um, so, you know, always stay true to yourself. That's gonna, that'll be the thing that actually makes you the best creative in the long run anyway. Right. Um, 
you know, that said, like, you're going to be asked to do things that you don't care about at all. You know, when I was 25, I was doing ads for, you know, octogenarians who needed vitamins um, and for, you know, alphabets, kids cereal for either the children or for the mom, right? It's like I was so far away from those things and I could care less about the brand purpose of either of those things. I guess, you know, I probably cared about health and humanity and I probably cared about, you know, kids enjoying their food, but they weren't purposes that I really cared about. Right. Um, you know, there's that saying, you know, if you love what you do, then you never work a day in your life. So if you're able to be, you know, probably one of the few people who's able to like get into a vein of your career where you spend your whole career doing only things that you're very passionate and purposeful about, I think you'll be very lucky. And I think along with that will come a lot of great work. Um, you know, from my experience and Dan and Joe chime in, like I've worked on a bunch of stuff that I'm not passionate about, but I don't disagree with. And I, you know, I get excited about the problem solving, right? I get excited about the innovation. I get excited about the emotional connection. I get excited about the idea. And so, yeah, I wasn't driven by the purpose of children's cereal or vitamins, but I was still driven by the responsibility to do that brand right. And the reason... There's a, there's a bunch of depth to the entrepreneur thing that I actually spend like a, I have a whole two hour thing on it. So there's, there's a lot of thinking behind it. And one of the thoughts behind it is you look at Elon Musk and he's a serial entrepreneur, right? A lot of entrepreneurs are serial entrepreneurs. They're amazing at, you know, taking responsibility for the risk of a venture and they do that and they sell it and they go do it again. And it's not the same venture, right? They'll go, because they're legally not allowed to go make the exact same thing. So they go make something else. And that's how I advise you to look at your career is like, you're a serial creative entrepreneur. That's really cool. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I don't wanna follow that with any, any advice from my experience, that was brilliant. Dan, you got anything? Well, I think that I'll never forget that this like one creative director I worked with, Lance Parrish, he's a really great guy. Um, on his portfolio, it just said, I want to make nice things with nice people. And you're not going to love the projects that you work on every day. But if you can find a good group of people that you trust and that believe in you, um, it'll make even you know the worst days uh, not so bad. So to add to what um, Sam said about finding things that you're passionate and that fit along, like look for the right people. It's like when you look for jobs, like, you know, a, a really shitty account can be made really great by a really talented creative director or really talented strategist. And um, like, it's like in, when you're in college, it's like take the, the professor and not the class. So I hope that uh, in what little wisdom I possess that that could follow up to that question. But Thank you, thank you. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I've definitely worked on lots of brands that I like don't really care about. I think there's a level of like, yeah, you're not going to care about every project that you work on. But I think if you value creativity, if you value being in an industry that like problem, creative problem solving is part of it, then you can kind of get past working on stuff that you don't care about that much because you get to flex that kind of creative muscle and you continue to develop that. So, Yeah. I think that's a great question. And hopefully that's, that's like a, a good one to go out on. Um, Sam, do you have any, any uh, parting words of wisdom for us? Just thank you, you all for the time. I know everyone's taken time out of their lives to, you know, do this. Um, I'm a like <clears throat> strong believer in never stopping making yourself better. Um, so I know this is not required by any school or any job. Um, so I have the utmost respect and appreciation for the time and effort and energy that you guys are all putting into this. And I think it's amazing. So I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're getting a bunch of love in the comments, Sam. Uh, thank you again for being here. And uh, we, will, we will see you all next week. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys.